Hypex. Well, I bet you're wondering why I have binoculars. Well, actually, the answer is pretty easy. I love springtime. I love to wake up in the morning and see everything that's turned green overnight. I love to feel the sun on my face, and I love to listen to the sounds of the birds. Hi, welcome to Around the Town with Marilyn Forbes. For today's show, we're actually gonna be spending some time here at Jacobs Creek, and we're going to be spending some time at Green Lake Dam as well. And we're going to be joined by area bird expert, Alex Pisato, who's gonna tell us all about the birds that we have in our very own backyard, how we can attract them, how we can watch them, and what we can do even to help them. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. As promised, we have with us today, Alex. And Alex actually is a wildlife photographer and he knows a whole bunch about birds and he's gonna share that with us. Thank you, thank you so much for being with us. Of course, thank you for having me. Okay, so where do we start? Um, well, yeah, so I guess a good place to start would be sort of like what my hobby is. So I, yes, you mentioned I'm a wildlife photographer. I'm also, before I was into the photography aspect, I was just uh, what you would call a birder okay. um, or a bird watcher. A lot of the times they don't really like when you call them bird watchers. Okay, <laughs> so, well, birder sounds yeah, cool. Yeah, birder, so right? So it's, yeah, turn it into a verb. Um, but uh, yeah, so birding, it's, it's a pretty big hobby. Um, it's grown quite a bit recently in the past like 10, 20 years. Mm, okay. um, <clears throat> traditionally, it's like an older hobby, um, but there's been a big wave of younger people getting into it. And all it really is is going out and sort of appreciating the, the bird life that's around you. Um, when I first got into it, I was in college. I took an ornithology class and didn't really know much about birds at the time ended up falling in love with it um, over the pandemic, especially. Uh, we were just set off with some binoculars and said, go ahead and go. Um, and uh, I just fell in love with it. And I, I kind of picked up the photography at the same time and they just went hand in hand. Hand in hand for another. you. Yeah. So then, okay, the first thing you do when you want to become a birder, do you recommend getting one of the books that you have here? Or what, um, what's the first step you think for yeah, people to do? So the first thing that I would recommend to do is, first of all, just kind of take go outside into your local area and just like listen and look and see what you can find. You honestly don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need um, anything other than your eyes and your ears. You don't need to travel to all these far off places. You just go out and sort of appreciate it. Once you start to get familiar with some of the ones that like hang around your home or your local park or something, um, I would recommend investing in um, a field guide and a uh, set, good set of binoculars. Okay. Um, those two things are really going to be some of your most valuable tools once you're getting started because the field guide tells you what you're seeing um, and helps you figure that out and then the binoculars allow you to get a much closer look at things. Okay. So, so yeah, I have a couple of examples. Um, so one of the, the um, let's start with the field guides actually. One of the absolute best field guides that I recommend, and you can tell that this one's pretty worn from me using it, um, is the Peterson Field Guide to uh, Birds of Eastern and Central North America. I have that one. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. So if, if you're in Pennsylvania or anywhere on the East Coast, this one, it's, it's, first of all, it's going to distill it down a little bit. You're going to eliminate some of those West Coast species so you don't get confused as right. much. Um, but inside, it's got some really nice color illustrations, um, some good descriptions. These are some seabirds, so we'll go back to some of the ones that might see in this area. Um, so in May right now, we're looking at a, a lot of migrants coming through, and you can see some of these look pretty similar, but um, it helps you to differentiate really well by just looking at this field guide. They have these different markings in here. Um, and then they have a little bit of information. So this is the Peterson guide. I really like that one. Um, some other ones, this one is pretty much interchangeable. Um, a lot of people prefer this one. This is the Sibley Guide, and I do believe this is what Audubon, the Audubon Society, like recommends. Oh, really? People. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the Sibley Guide, it's basically the same. The pictures are, are, in my opinion, a little bit smaller, but they do oh, go a they, little bit more. And they in show depth. the areas even where yes. you can. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Which the okay. last, the Peterson does as well, but these ones, I, I think they give a little bit more information if you're interested in learning about the birds. Um, they also show a lot of these what are called alternate plumages. So, um, for example, let me see if I can find one. A lot of bird males and females are quite different from one another. Um, like the cardinal that we were yeah. just talking about. Yeah, yes. so, so right, I think, where is it? Indigo buntings, for example. This is a common one we, we can see in Pennsylvania in the summer. I think males I are bright today. blue. Females are this really drab brown. Really? Yeah. So it'll it'll kind of show you in a walk through all these different oh, ideas. Okay. I think I book. actually saw one of these on my way here today. Nice. Um, totally possible. Yeah. They're they're pretty common around here, and and this is the time when they're moving in. Um, so yeah, Sibley and Peterson are really the two best ones in my mind. Um, other ones include the Audubon Society. Theirs is just pictures. 
Um, they do have a little bit of information in the back. It's a little bit wordier. Um, I Ooh, really these are pretty. Yeah, yeah, I really like just looking at the pictures in here. Um, <laughs> and, As a photographer, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and 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 so you can. This one's very nice to just kind of scroll through quickly and see something that matches. Okay. Um, and then there are some that are a little bit more specified. If you're really just starting out, they have some like backyard bird versions. I know Peterson has one specifically, but these will just really distill it down to ones that you probably are most likely to see in your backyard. Hmm, okay. Now, um, I actually met Alex a couple months ago. He was giving uh, a demonstration. And one of the things that he pointed out when you're looking at birds, and I think is so interesting, is don't stress yourself out looking at the whole bird. Find something in particular to focus yes. on, right? Like some, some different yeah. coloring or something. Because as he pointed out, some of the species, there's so many that are close. So if you just find like one little thing to like focus on. Yeah, so we'll go back, we'll go back to the warblers um, for a second. I mean, that's such a, that was such a great, you know, suggestion. Yeah. And it makes sense. Well, so, so we call those field marks. Um, and that's what the field guide is there to help you identify. So you see these little arrows. They'll point to the important parts, basically. You notice most of these birds are like base yellow. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, so, so look for, the, oh, okay. Yep, base yellow. This one says, oh, this got this little mark underneath its beak here. Maybe, you know, that is indicative of that species. Um, whereas this one has these brown streaks as it's pointing to on the chest there. So that's what your the basic idea of the, the field mark is. It's something that you can really quickly say, hey, oh, I see that has streaks on its right. breast mm -hmm. and its base yellow. Let me go and you know, reference that, see what I got. Most of the time, you aren't gonna get these fantastic cinema quality looks at birds. They're very fleeting, they're often backlit, um, especially some of the smaller ones, you just don't get to spend much time with them, unfortunately. And so if you really wanna know what you're seeing, you gotta get good at picking those out. Picking and it, this yep. is This is what'll help you for sure when you're getting started. Um, I can hear a woodpecker. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I can hear a lot over there. Yeah. <laughs> the other alternative, and I'll pull this up on my phone really quick, I'm not sure how well it'll, um, actually show up on the camera, but um, it's an app that's called Merlin. I don't know if you can see that, um, but it's put together by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is like leader in the world um, for bird science. Yeah, they're going strong. <laughs> I'll say. Um, and this one is really fantastic because it's basically just an electronic field guide. Oh, and so that's cool. So you can cool. scroll through, let's say we pick a one of those warbler species again, you can click on it, it will Show, show you it. various pictures and my favorite part about it is that it'll play the sounds so if you hear something and you're like what was that and then you can kind of sift through um it's also a great way to practice when you see something to just sort of associate the sound with it it's helped me immensely to learn that and um, it's a really great resource plus you don't have to carry around a big book. right right so um, it's sort of the new way that field guides are moving toward there's something to be said about the artistry that goes into the original ones um, sure but uh yeah so it's very handy to have that on your phone so then sound identification is really something that you think is a good thing for somebody that's starting out to learn to uh, kind of get the idea because even just yes. a little bit ago he heard he heard a bird he was like oh he said this is great if we could see it because it was something yeah. that was a little bit more unusual yeah so i i would say that it's probably your second step um sight is the number one thing that you want to learn um once you start seeing them you can start associating them with sounds um and what but when you do learn the sound calls or the sound id it's going to really open up what you actually start to find um in Pennsylvania, if you're in the woods and you know things are in these uh, dense brush and things like that, sometimes you'll only pick them out by ear, or sometimes you'll be okay. walking and you'll hear it by ear first, and then you can kind of say, okay, let me try to triangulate. I know what I'm where looking for. Is. Okay, yeah. all right. So um, it's been a huge help for me picking up new species, and as as photography um, goes, you know, just to to be able to recognize them by ears. But it, it takes a lot of practice, and so same with the the. Um, the ID. One thing I would really recommend to anybody thinking of getting started is just like don't get discouraged because it's very easy to get confused. It's very easy to get overwhelmed, especially this time of year. There's hundreds of hundreds, things calling yes. at you at the same time. So um, take it at whatever pace you need to take it at. Don't feel bad. It's not a competition. It's just to have fun, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's um, one major recommendation when it comes to ID. Um, I think it's really interesting, before we go to yeah, sounds, yeah. speaking of sounds, um, when Alex talked before, there are, there are eagles in the area. We, mm -hmm. we do know that. There's a couple nesting pair and yes. stuff in that. 
And when you see eagles on TV or in movies, it's this majestic and this this horrible mm -hmm. noise. How does an eagle really sound? Uh, this, uh, eagles, <laughs> they kind of sound a little bit wimpy. They um, do. Yeah. I think it's... Uh, so so I'll, I'll actually, this, this is a good segue into uh, playing some calls. So this is probably, if you've heard of Bald Eagle on television that wasn't a nature documentary, you've probably heard something that sounds like this. Pretty common, right? And I even knew what that was. Yes. The only one I could identify. <laughs> so, that, so that's actually a red-tailed hawk. Um, I always call them like the bald eagles, like voice actor. Um, a real bald eagle sounds like it's, it's kind of wimpy um, for as big a bird as they are. Let yeah, and like it. I said, you 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 always see that too, and I never thought like. Yep. But that's it's so this a is, this is a bald eagle. It's kind of just these little twitters. That doesn't sound at all what you'd expect nope. it to. <laughs> it's not a very fearsome sound, so I, I can see why they dub it over. But you know, that's another thing. Once you get into bird watching or birding, it's like all that stuff starts to like get on your nerves a little bit like you see it and you're like that's not right or another one is uh, oh i see okay yeah, you start there's a there's a really common bird called a kookaburra um that lives in australia mm -hmm. and they have this incredibly distinctive call um and any jungle movie regardless of what continent they're on they'll play a kookaburra is that the sound. Ooh, ah, that a, yeah, yeah ah. you know it yeah you know you know it all off the bat it's like a really distinctive sound and you're like this is africa there's oh, no that is so crazy there. and so it's little things just kinda, <laughs> but it's fun it's fun at the same time so so alex actually yeah. has a couple and i don't i do not know what these are these are these are common yes. birds that we would hear and I should know every single one of these because my children bought me one of those bird clocks. <laughs> oh, yeah, remember yeah. those back in the yeah. day? So it was the 12 most common birds. So do you want to start off with a, with a softball or with a, with a little bit of a challenge? Uh, give me a soft one. Okay, okay. That's a, that's a robin. That is. <laughs> that's an American robin. Um, yeah, so most people know that one. What else we got? Okay, let me get this next one. So this is another one that most people... Probably no. I'm going to play the harder version of it, and then I'll play the one that people probably probably okay. would recognize. Oh, it's a cardinal. <laughs> so this is its song. Okay. A lot of people now don't I know. hear this, so it has to be in my yard somewhere. Okay. A lot of people don't know it by the song. So okay. the song, they, they say it goes, hey, sweetie. That's what the mnemonic device oh, is. Oh, okay. There's a lot of mnemonics in this. The one people most recognize it by is this. That one. A uh, wren. Good guess. That's a black capped chickadee. So maybe this one's a little bit better. There you go. That's the really familiar one. So they say chickadee dee 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 dee. Okay, that's a chickadee. Yes. Okay. That is a black capped chickadee. So that's another very common East Coast bird um, that we get here. We actually have two types of chickadees in Pennsylvania, and in our region they kind of mix, so it's a little bit tough to tell them apart. Um, the black capped and the Carolina chickadee, which comes up from the South. They look nearly identical they sometimes will hybridize so that's that's another cool thing mm. that you kind of learn once you're getting into these um okay let me see the next we're going to do like one or two more then we're actually going to go and see what we can yeah. see in here so this one is one that we will definitely hear today not many people know this one's around it's not a tough to tip mouse it is a hard one what is it so this is called oh, that's a pretty. That's, yeah. that's unique. So they say sweet, 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 I'm very sweet, or something like that. Uh, again, mnemonics. That's a yellow warbler. So oh, okay. hopefully we're going to see some okay. of those today. Really cool bird that was one of my, um, they call it, you know, like, almost like a spark to get me into the hobby. I had no idea these things were around me for my entire life, yet they're one of the most common um, warbler species that shows up every year in the spring across North America. So, like, seeing this thing it looks like a tropical bird it's bright fluorescent yellow um, and they hang out in these sort of wetlandy areas seeing that four years ago was one that really got me like hey there's a lot of cool stuff out here that i don't really know about um and so that one and, and once you hear the song like you'll you'll be able to recognize it once we get out there i uh, hope so, yeah <laughs> okay so we're going to go into the woods a little yep. bit and then after that we're going to head to the wetlands yeah so stay with us so um, obviously, you are going to see different kinds of birds in different habitats, different yes. situations. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go into the woods here a little bit. Um, I hate to say typically, but what is something that we can be looking for or listening for? 
well, just yes. in a regular wooded area in Pennsylvania. So, so spring <clears throat> is a great time for to be in the woods. Um, winter and summer are a little less productive, but springtime things are showing up. Things are getting settled on their uh, breeding territories. And so one that I really love to listen for this time of year is called the wood thrush. Oh. Um, they have a beautiful song. They're a relative of the robin um, in the thrush family. And they actually have the ability to harmonize with themselves. So they can sing two notes at once. Um, really? Yeah, they're, they're very, very cool. They're one of the most beautiful songs that we have. I think I heard one pretty distantly. Today? <gasps> yeah, just now. Okay, so then the Hard best to thing say. to do is stop talking, Marilyn. <laughs> Oh, we also have some pileated, we have some pileated woodpeckers. Oh, is here. that how you say it? Pileated. pileated. I thought it was pileated. Tomato, tomato. Okay. <laughs> um, we do have, there's two of them. They're up the hillside. I don't know. We might need to move a little further to be able to see them, but. Um, I can't believe we can't hear, or that's probably is who we, we heard a little yes, bit earlier. Yeah, so pileated woodpeckers, they are a spectacular bird. They're the largest woodpecker in North America, um, currently living. And um, they're pretty common um, in, in a lot of our woods. So yeah, I just saw two of them. One of them took off. I have those as well. They really like my, my mm -hmm. old trees. Another very common bird and one that I'm hearing right now um, is up there. So this is where the, the birding by ear comes oh, okay. in. Okay. Um, that's called a red-eyed vireo. Um, they are one of our most abundant woodland birds. Red-eyed vireo? Vireo, yes. V-I-R-E-O, a vireo, and they make a it's, it's not super distinctive, but once you hear it enough times there, you'll hear them everywhere. They're, they're pretty abundant. The one thing that I will say about birding in the woods, um, it can be kind of tricky for starters, mostly because the leaves block out a lot of things. So the best time to really go out into the woods is I would say early April um, to mid April. Once, once you get some of those migratory species coming in, but the leaves aren't really fully leafed out yet. Getting into um, second week of May here, it's uh, pretty pretty grown in and we've had sort of a strange spring this year so um, the leaves came in a little bit quicker than the birds did but um, yeah there's a lot there's a lot more in a forest than we can see mostly um, and that's where I just like to go out and listen um, to see what or and to, we're hearing a lot I don't know how much yes. you're, you're able to hear there we are definitely hearing a lot mm -hmm. and and as far as like looking now let's talk real quick about our binoculars. equipment yeah of course yeah so binoculars are probably one of your your most important tools that you have um, once you are going out into the field so there's a variety of different ones you can use um, this is a pretty nice pair to get started with they're only about sixty dollars so if you're not sure if you want to invest um, the bushnell all-purpose um, 10 by 42 binoculars i think they're like 60 bucks at walmart um, so, so it's not a big investment no, it's like but the, but they are pretty decent quality for what they what they are this is about as cheap as i would go though i, I would not recommend many people go below 60 80 even a hundred dollars um reason being you're going to sacrifice your optics and you're just going to end up frustrated because you can't focus on anything okay. um, my go-to and the one i've used for for my entirety of birding um, are the nikon pro staff uh, 7s um, they also have a 3s version that's a little bit cheaper but they, these are I, I cannot recommend these highly enough they're lightweight they're compact they have the widest field of vision I have ever experienced in a set of binoculars um, and a very nice depth of field so you don't have to constantly adjust back and forth. Um, another little plug for these, I actually was on, on a kayak, they're advertised as waterproof, I was on a kayak in a salt marsh, my entire kayak sank with these around my neck, I'm holding my camera above my head, these are soaked in seawater, take them home. There's nothing wrong. Really? I rinsed them off wow. in the sink and they were perfectly fine. You so, should get in touch with the company. I was going to say, hey, if you want to sponsor me, <laughs> Nikon, I, I, I love your products. I can't recommend them highly enough. So, so um, you do, it basically it doesn't have to be a giant investment. You can, no, no. And, and like I said, these are about $200. So, um, you know, for some people, that's a pretty small investment. For some people, that's a pretty big investment. Sure. Um, so you can go anywhere from, but I, I would say generally you want to stay above the $50 range. If you go much cheaper than that, it's just going to be a waste of money. Okay. Um, and I usually look for 10 by 42s when it comes to magnification. It's a nice middle range where you can see things that are close to you, but you can also see things pretty far okay. away as awesome. well. So, okay. Well, we're going to go to the wetlands now, see if yeah. we can see, because Alex actually said he was there yesterday or the day before. 
both. And so, both. <laughs> I practically live well, out there this time of he, year. So. He said, for those yeah. of you that might be interested, that's actually one of the best areas in our area yes. to, uh, to, to yeah, it's bird. Called the, it's called the Jacobs Creek Environmental Wetlands, um, and it's a PennDOT wetland remediation site. So the way that works is anytime PennDOT comes through and removes a section of a wetland for construction projects, um, they are required by law to recreate wetland in a different place. And okay. so areas like this kind of get um, built up and expanded upon as they complete more projects. And uh, yeah, it's pretty great for birds, so. Cool. Stay with us. Yep. Hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. Uh, so this is the Jacobs Creek Environmental Wetlands. Now I'm hearing lots. Yep, so that that you're hearing is, is actually in that tree right over there. Oh, I see him. That's okay. a gray cat bird. And he's calling, I can hear another one answering yep. him. So there it is right there. They call them cat birds for a reason. They kind of sound like a cat. Now, okay, if I wanted to actually like attract birds in my, to my yard, mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you do other than, other than uh, obviously feed and stuff? Is, yeah. there, is there anything else you can do? Well, so one of the best things that I like to do is, is um, encourage people to plant native plants uh, okay. to our area. So. If, you know, as we're walking through here, you'll notice it's not very much like a suburban yard. Um, and the less we can make our areas like suburban okay. areas, so the more beneficial they'll be for wildlife. As wild as, as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, it can, a be as, box. Yeah, it can be <laughs> as simple as um, planting certain shrubs. Like this is a black raspberry shrub right here. This is a native species that they um, provides a lot of benefit for bird species because it you know, has that fruit. Um, some of these other trees um, that we're passing over here are uh, dogwood shrubs. Um, dogwood's a really nice one. And now these are sort of wetlands uh, specific species, but there's a whole variety of native plants that you can put in. Other things are like water features um, and just variety in, in the habitats that you have. So instead of maybe only having a lot of wildflowers, maybe try to vary that between wildflowers and shrubs and even a few trees when when you can. I okay. mean it's a lot of a lot to undertake, but if you really truly want to see the most variety in your own yard, recreating that natural habitat is probably your best bet. Did you hear that one over there? That's one you might recognize. Is it a cardinal? Uh -uh. <laughs> it's the one we talked about. If he does it again. There he is. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Oh, oh sweet. okay. That is a yellow warbler. So this is prime yellow warbler habitat. Um, they love these. Okay, we have cat shrubs. birds actually flying at us here. Yep. So the it like, do you suggest to walk or to stay in one spot and wait until they come to you, or like, what's your suggestion as far as being able to see more? Yeah, my my general strategy is I'll very slowly walk until I see something and just sort of pause, like we're doing right now, kind of scan. A lot of times. Um, you know, let's say you hear something as, you, as you're kind of strolling, then you just pause. It will, if you don't disrupt the bird's natural movements, they'll just kind of hop out onto the open and oftentimes enough for you to take a picture or get your binoculars At least you get them. to see them and... Yeah, so like right over there. Oh, oh I just saw out. him. That was a yellow warbler, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, yep, it is. Which just standing there, you know, waiting on it, it just popped up and showed itself, so... Okay. I see. Oh, I see it. Yep. I see it. Yeah, bright yellow. It's he like is bright yellow. yellow. Yep. I think that one might be a female. It's hard to tell. Yeah, it is. How do you? How can you tell it's a female? So, so that one doesn't have very many streaks on its on its underbelly. The males will typically have like really rusty streaks. I lost now, it. It could be just a young male, but it's a little early in the season for it to be that young. Um, they haven't like laid eggs yet. So. There's a, a female blue jay, I think. On, on the underside? She, uh, she... That was a cat bird. <laughs> I told you it takes practice, so. <laughs> sweet, sweet, sweet. I'm very sweet. Do different types of trees attract different types of birds? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so some things that don't, this is an invasive honeysuckle bush. This is a really common ornamental that people plant in their yards. They're basically worthless for birds. Oh. Um, they have berries, but they don't really give them much nutritional value. So these ones are not great ones. Um, a good alternative is this right here. They get a little bigger. This is a black cherry. Um, so you can see it's starting to get its cherries on it. Um, this one just went through bloom. There are some around that still have the flowers on them. Um, but this is a native plant to Pennsylvania. It has a lot better nutritional value to its uh, 
it's fruits. Oh, what was that? Probably a cat bird again. <laughs> um, it was red. No, I don't uh, <laughs> So I take it there's, there's your wood thrush singing. That. That. It's, it's a, do, 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 that? Yeah. Okay. There. It's a very ethereal sound. I always think it's so cool when you hear one and then you hear yep. another one calling back. Mm -hmm. That is just the neatest thing. I love to listen to that in the morning. Yep. Except when they're crows. I don't like oh. crows. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, no, definitely there, there are plants that have benefits and plants that don't. Um, this is another great one, box elder. Um, these will have seeds. The seeds have actually fallen off of this one at this time, but um, they have some seeds that things will eat it through the winter even. Oh, okay. Um, oh, there's some of there's some your cherry bl blossoms right there. Here? Yeah. But you can also see the other important thing with these plants, and probably a bigger, um, oh yeah, that's a turkey vulture. Probably a bigger thing with the native plants is that they attract so many insects. So like there's a bunch of insects oh, flying around there. Oh, okay. Things like our common yellow throat, our yellow warbler, um, a lot of our, um, you know, the, probably I'd say the majority of our songbirds are primarily, if not exclusively, insect eaters. So that's okay. part of the, you know, they migrate. They're only here when the bugs are out um, in, the, in the warm time. And um, they rely a lot on insects. So the more insects you can attract to your yard, the better it's going to be for those species as well. Um, you see a lot of woodpecker. Yeah. They've been, they're, tree, like, they're like an east couple here, huh? Yeah, you can see um, actually right on this dead limb sticking out. See the holes there yeah, at the end? Yeah, that top and... hole was a nest cavity for a red-bellied woodpecker, and there's another oh. one up top. I wouldn't be surprised. Way up top there? Yep. There's okay. another one here. Oh, that's so cool. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised if it was one of the same ones used in different places. They don't typically use them two years in a row, but okay. Um, yeah, I've seen I've seen them in that one. That's how I know that that was. There are birds nest. that do that, though, right? Use the same nest. Like I know robins do that. They'll use um, their same nest. Some do. Um, I wouldn't say many do, though. No? I'm okay. not sure about robins. Um, a lot of birds will kind of take over other birds' nests. Yeah, we had that um, happen last year. Yeah, so speaking of woodpeckers, that's sort of a, an important role that they play. Um, you know, people put out bird boxes. Bird boxes are really just simulating natural cavities in trees. Oh, okay. And a lot of those are started by woodpeckers. They'll, they'll excavate their own cavity, then they'll abandon it, and then something the next year, like a chickadee or a bluebird or... Um, you know, there's a whole big variety that can get in. Depending on the size, too, you can get owls in, in those woodpecker holes. You can get lots of things. And so they're a really important species in our, in our forest ecosystem. Well, yeah. this has been very interesting, yeah. very educational. Um, you gave us some great ideas where right here in the area that we can go. And, mm -hmm. But, like, basically, you can just go anywhere and expect to see some type of bird. Yeah, the, I birds. think the, the biggest thing is slowing down, looking around, paying extra attention to, like, something that you just see fly by and, and kind of asking yourself the question like what was that and that'll sort of get you started down that path when you ask yourself like what did i see i feel like that's where you start to get get into it more and it, and it becomes more and more rewarding awesome so. well thank you so much this yeah. has been great and i'll tell you what i have been here i don't know how many times and this is the first time i've really sat back and listened to the birds and mm -hmm. it is amazing yeah. so i was here about you. three hours last night <laughs> so it, like i said he it's, said it's uh, his favorite place in it the is. Area, it's so. really nice well thank so. you for sharing this with me I, I appreciate it yeah. and thank you of course well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. I know I did. I thought it was fun. It was very educational. And uh, I learned a lot. And I'm looking forward to going out and looking for some more birds. And before we, we sign off here, um, how can people get in touch with you if they have questions or if they would like you to speak? or? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, probably the best way is on social media. I have an Instagram, uh, Alexander underscore Salamander. Um, you can follow me at. I'm also on Facebook. Um, and uh, another great resource would be to join the Westmoreland Bird and Nature Club. We're a local group that does um, monthly outings to various locations. If you're looking to get into birding, it's one of the easiest and best ways to find that help and community that you need. Again, thank you. Thank you for sharing this area with us. We know there's a lot of catbirds here, mm. and we know how to identify those yes. so we can move on from there. <laughs> Again, thank you. Of course. And, ready? Yep. Okay. And remember, folks, keep, keep smiling, smiling, keep dreaming, dreaming, and keep, keep watching. watching.